Ooh, happy Friday, folks. Welcome in. It is another episode of We Have the High Ground, the official Star Wars show on the Pop Culture Universe YouTube channel. I'm one of your hosts, Colin. Joining me as always is my man, Fox. How's it going, buddy? What's happening, YouTube beautiful people out there? Yes, uh, we're on the, the book season, if you will. Um, yes, I'm good. Very, very good. Thank you. Um, you know, we've we reviewed Light of the Jedi last week. Uh, we ranked our favorite canon books, and uh, today we're ranking the top five Legends books. Um, we also have a guest on as well, Colin, to to help us with that list. Yes, someone else is here to claim the high ground for themselves and a bit of an introduction. This man should be, you know, no stranger to the deep sweaties of the Star Wars universe. He is one of the former champions of the Dragon Con Star Wars trivia ultimate spectacle, whatever, like the, the <laughs> basically the where the Star Wars sweaties go to throw down. It's Thomas Harper, the uh, just an up and coming rookie in the showdown, which is something that Boggs and I also cover. So we'd like to welcome in him onto the show. How's it going, Thomas? Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Well, welcome in, and uh, yeah, just give us like your, like, give us your Star Wars story, man. How did you come to find Star Wars? Like, what is it about this thing that drives you to come talk to some randos on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> you guys mentioned EU, and I was like, I don't care what I cut you off and didn't let you finish the sentence. I said I'm all in. Uh, no, I I discovered Star Wars as a kid, like probably everybody watching this, probably like you two, my dad was my entry into it all. I think he was just counting down the time until it was appropriate. To, like, how young can I show and expose my kid to all this stuff? And so I watched it for the very first time on like a bootleg VHS tape that was that he recorded off of Fox or TBS, like commercials and everything. It was probably like an old VHS tape that had, you know, a wedding video or something like that on it. And it, it got recorded over. So crummy quality. We had this old, uh, this is in the early 90s, but we had this old console TV, you know, one of those that's encased in like an entire tree of wood and a tiny little screen. And uh, I was just hooked immediately. As soon as the, the Tana V4 came across the screen, as soon as the, uh, the Devastator just endlessly comes across the screen and seeing Vader step aboard the ship. I was enthralled. I just sat there slack jawed as a kid. And as a kid of the 90s, there was a huge gap in Star Wars. I mean, t today we sit here and we're blessed with just a tsunami of new content, whether it's on screen or off. But then I, I, I think the, the folks that grew up seeing the movies in theater would have called it the dark times. And it wasn't until they started releasing new books in the nineties, which is why this topic is so awesome. That was my new star Wars. So throughout the nineties, as I grew up and, and went through elementary and middle school, um, the books were, I was gobbling those up because that was the only new star Wars that we got there. I, nobody had any clue that the prequels were in development. Nobody had any clue that there was going to be new on screen star Wars. So the kind of stuff we're talking today, that was it. So I'd go to the bookstore and be like a kid going to see force awakens today. I'd be like, okay, let me pick the next one out and that's it. So uh, and then fortunately, I, I um, was the right age when the special editions hit and the prequels. And, and so that all was a rocket ship that, that just sealed it, sealed the deal for me. But yeah, that's where it all got started. So we're talking foundational stuff for me here today. Yeah, I'm interested because now, now I'm even more interested of how our lists are going to be different because, I mean, I feel like you guys are probably five to ten years older than me so i'm interested in, like the foundations of like what you like you know what you were bringing was like i look over at my list i have three prequel era novels right. in my list and it's just like that's the stuff to me that like i was thirsting for once i finished all that and then i was i guess i was more thirsty for like well what happens during the clone wars and james lucino was like well let me tell you about what was <laughs> Sit happening down. During... i will tell you exactly what's going on but, oh this is great so I'm interested now to see, like, oh, this list is going to span, and I'm excited. This is going to be fun. Box, I mean, dude, this is going to be uh, – this is going to 
It's going to be too much fun. I'm, I'm excited now. This is going to be awesome. Yes. Yeah, so we, we have rules as well, Thomas, of how we arrange the top five and how we kind of read them off. But before I do that, what is your favorite? I know it's putting you on the spot, but what is your favorite canon Star Wars book? What do you have? Favorite? Probably be a little unusual, but mine is Twilight Company, the, uh, the first Battlefront book. Although oh, okay. I don't know why it's called Battlefront other than that it came out as a tie into the games loosely. Mm -hmm. But I love that stuff. 61st Mobile Infantry, Twilight Company. Yeah, I'm pretty that's, sure that's one of the only like canon books. All over that book last week. No, the Battlefront 2, I didn't like. <laughs> oh, the Battlefront 2 like one? Yeah, okay, yeah, the yeah, Battlefront 2 one. one. Got it. I like the story yeah. made the game, but it's just the actual book. Was, I just find it so boring about yeah. the uh, um, Inferno Squad, wasn't it? So The Dreamers. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah it wasn't for me. But uh, yes, I think I picked uh, Lords of the Sith uh, and Colin picked, um, remind me, it wasn't Bloodline. Sure. I also no, yeah, Lost Stars. Stars. Right. Yeah, Lost yeah. Stars. Okay. Excellent yeah. picks. There is, yeah. Uh, so how we do the list is, um, so obviously top five, we go from five to one. And if you're, um, let's say, let's say just for argument's sake, I pick the Throne Trilogy as my number five. But let's say that's your number one. What you have to say is that you have the high ground. So, and then we'll talk about that later. So when we get to the ones, then we'll obviously we'll discuss that. Um, so it makes sense as we do it. Um, but Yes, we, we'll show you how it's done. But uh, we'll start off with... Uh, shall I start off with my five? Yeah, go ahead. Colin, yeah. Take us away. Okay. So I think it's just called Kenobi. Yes. Okay, with uh, John... Written by John Jackson Miller. Is that on anyone's list? No. Not no. mine. Okay. So, not yeah, it's not a great book. Yeah, but. it's just... Yeah, these are... So, spoilers, my books are more the character-driven uh, kind of quieter stories, or my favorites are, are that... Um, Yes, so this is kind of uh, one of my favorite characters, full stop. So it's such a simple story. Um, you know, it's like a drama-driven uh, narrative. He deals with the Tuscan Raiders and how they're kind of the aftermath of the attack from Anakin Skywalker and what's left on them on Tatooine. You find out why he's, um, you know, called um, kind of why he's known as Ben and why he's a hermit as well. And it just kind of, like I said, it just fills in the character stuff um in between so even when disney announced the takeover in what was it 2014 my my most anticipated things are or what i wanted to see was the you know the um the continuation of the skywalker saga let's say um then was basically a kenobi story uh, between return uh, revenge of the sis and and uh, a new hope and after that it's probably kind of vader hunting jedi they're my three main stories i wanted to see and this was the only kind of option i had to or the closest thing to that so uh yes definitely my number five i've listened to it a number of times particularly on the audio book you know because it has the music and you know he reminisces and things like that and you hear the tuscan raiders and anakin and you hear the kind of um you know the audio work with that so yes definitely love that uh and that's my number five so you've uh you like it as well um thomas yeah that was one that i think it hurt me a little when it didn't make the cut for the canon reboot mm -hmm. and uh, you know i think probably john jackson miller would would say the same although he's a humble guy so that one i that's one of those where i read it and i desperately want it to be part of the the official narrative but it's just it's so good hopefully we'll do hopefully we'll do with the with the season coming out well with this series canobi series coming out uh have you read it colin oh yeah yeah read it and listen to it as well i'm pretty sure it's it's kind of a sign of what did and didn't make the cut where it's like, oh, we will include this Tarkin novel because it makes sense and does not ruffle any feathers on future <laughs> productions. And then like, oh, maybe we want to make Kenobi. So let's not make anything too official. But then they went ahead with the comic stuff, which kind of dabbles into a bit of this same tone of this book of a man on his own struggling in the desert. And that's something I, I, I can't wait to see. I'm so excited for the show. I'm so excited. I hope they do the show in that sort of format that the comics adopted, where it's like tales from his journal and, and you're getting peaks, but not the whole story, which is neat. Which you could say that they robbed from the, uh, from the Lando novels. Yeah. The well, Calrissian yeah. Chronicles, which I wish they would do too. Right. When they do the Lando show, which you could just have Billy Decent up. Well, let me tell you a story. And this is the <laughs> one time where I found a lovely companion in a. <laughs> and then it looks around, makes sure there's. No... But yeah, that'd be cool. 
Kenobi as well. I like the uh, yeah. That's just it's just set up. It's too easy for them to not just have him sitting there either jotting down something or I'm curious if it's gonna be uh like a story that jumps around or if it's going to you know just be one six hour journey through the desert. It'll be exciting. That's a good mention, Boggs, of the audio books. I discovered those only after the canon reset. If you haven't listened to a Star Wars book, if you haven't listened to an audio book at all, the Star Wars books are done very differently. My image of these things, of any audio book, was just like a boring, just narrator droning on and just reading it to me. And so I had no interest. But then my buddy was like, no, you've got to try the Star Wars audiobooks is completely different. It's like listening to a movie and it's, it, it's worth a subscription to audible or whatever, you know, buy the audio book. They're just, like you said, Boggs, it's got music. They do the narr- the good narrators, which is pretty much all of them do voices. So it's like, you're listening and can picture these characters. It's just top notch production value. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We back um, that a thousand percent. So Thomas brings us to your number five. I will start with, and and mine, I'm going to cut. I have to cut one because we have uh, only five books. So technically it's it's two trilogies, but we'll play by the rules and only no, do five. Fine. Make your own rules. Screw it. You can, you can well, my you first is going to be the very first book in the Han Solo trilogy. Ooh. There it is. The Paradise Snare. And this is, we were talking about this before the show. I still, I don't have a complete collection of EU books, but what I do have are all my originals that I bought as a kid. Uh, you know, the, the rare occasion where I'd get to go to the bookstore and, and pick something up. And I got lucky enough to meet AC Crispin, the author of these books. And so there's nice. a little, little signature there from her, but what I will say about this trilogy is that this was like this. And then my, my top three are two of the time periods that I really wanted to see that the solo trilogy in this paradise snare starts with, it, it's like solo, a star Wars story, but in book form. And it's, I think this is the, this is the first trilogy that I read, even though my top three came like technically came out before it. So this Paradise Snare came out in 97. So this is like the the year the first special edition came out. And I was just in peak Star Wars mode. And so I finally decided to give the books a chance. And this book covers Han's early life pre-Empire in the Paradise Snare. And it's just, it's awesome. I wish that they had just taken this book, this book series and ported it over and made the movie, even though I love solo, but it's just so good. There's sort of this running narrative throughout the trilogy that you get this deep look into, to hut culture and hut wars and, and how Han fits into it. I remember reading this book in particular, and then going back and watching a new hope and and thinking about like the price like the 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 showdown with greedo and just thinking about it in a totally different way um you know this book doesn't end with the cantina scene obviously that takes some time in the trilogy but it was just like you're seeing han get his feet wet and get uh experience as a smuggler for the first time so it had if if you loved solo if you loved the magic that was on screen getting to him getting to see him cut his teeth and sort of figure out his way in the galaxy that was my experience reading this book and i was just blown away bogs any uh did you read this one no i don't believe so um but the more you, uh, thomas is explaining it the more it sounds familiar so i don't believe i've read it um but yeah i'll definitely note it down and give it a try um, but yeah, it's, um, it sounds quite similar to this, a li- well, a little bit similar to the solo movie, like you said. So it sounds like they've, uh, they borrowed from that, but yeah, sounds good. Yeah. I've, uh, I th- believe some eight year old version of me read this book <laughs> and I, if I'm remembering correctly, I was just, yeah, it had the same feeling that you did. I went and watched episode four and I was like, oh, well, that's a little better. And that's yeah. nice. It's nice to know. Like, you know, it doesn't necessarily change the entire experience of the movie for you, but it's nice to have a little head cannon when you go into something like that. It's nice to exactly. think like, oh, 
I do know where this weird guy came from that was just sitting in this bar and now we're all friends with. It's nice to know these things. I'm ex it's nice. I'm trying to think that I read the I'm trying to read the other one. So now I gotta go find the audiobooks and listen to yeah. the audiobooks and they'll be and they'll be pretty good. I do have all three of this uh of this series still from when I was a kid. So I marched in. The pages are like yellowing because it's you know, 23 or so years old. And I remember going to get it signed. This is like my first time at Dragon Con. I just brought, because my buddy told me, he was like, well, the Star Wars authors will be there. And like, this is the first show that I had gone to that had actual celebrities, like movie and TV stars. And I couldn't give a damn about <laughs> those folks. He was, I was like, well, what, what Star Wars authors are you talking about? He's like, oh yeah, like Kevin J. Anderson, Timothy Zahn, AC Crispin and I'm just like starstruck. And so I, I went down, I had my little suitcase. And it was like a few clothes and then all books <laughs> to get them signed. And I'm like, I'm sorry that this book is so beat up, but this is the one, this is my original. So please excuse that. I'm sure that, that made them love it even more. So that brings us over to my number five. Mm -hmm. That'd be James Lucino's Labyrinth of Evil is not probably on anyone else's list for me this book was uh one of those ones that came out at the right time in the right place it was uh kind of what we now know as season seven of the clone wars it was the prequel to episode three this is where we actually figure out what happens on the planet of uh kato namoidia between Anakin and Obi-Wan filling in that little line, that little throwaway line in episode three that, you know, we never really figure out what happened. It doesn't count. It does. That one doesn't count. <laughs> doesn't, that, that business, doesn't. that business, it, 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 doesn't count, it doesn't count. But I, I love this one. It, it gets you some action with their um, squad seven, which I think is one of the underrated clone units that doesn't really get a lot of talk about in the, uh, in the expanded universe. And I just like it how it all ties in with the movie. And it kind of, for me, made me feel like it in the same way that, you know, this we were just talking about with Solo. You had a bit more uh, reason to be like, oh, well, I guess they were kind of close to figuring out who Darth Sidious was. Like, there, it, it kind of gives you that same feeling that uh, was that season six of the Clone Wars where they get very close to figuring yeah. out who it is. And then... Oh, we don't figure Whoops. out who it is. Yeah. Sorry, fives. Sorry, fives. We appreciate your service. <laughs> Which I actually saw one of those memes the other day where it was like, uh, match your birthday to the Jedi or to the clone trooper, and that's who you have to protect you. And I got fives. And I <laughs> nice. was like, oh, jeez. No. Not no, gonna, not gonna at least you're not going to be betrayed. True. Loyal. <laughs> a loyal, loyal friend. But yeah, I doubt this is on uh, either of y'all's uh, list. But Thomas, have you read this book? No, I have not. But it sounds like it needs to be on my list because I'm a huge clone fan. Yeah, it's got everything you want where it's got it. I mean, it kind of throws every main character from three and sets them up to be where they start up in three, which is kind of cool. You got Mace is kind of uh, leading a group of of Padawans against a bit of a insurrection. It's kind of cool if there's it's a bit of fun stuff in there with them. Boggs, has this been on your list at all? Or have you read this one? No, not not seen that one. So like I said, mine are more my favorites are more kind of quieter character driven plot ones as opposed to like an action one. Which are good. Like obviously, you know, a lot of mine have action scenes in the stuff but and war moments and things like that. But just my favorite ones are the kind of maybe characters we know that fills in the history, the backstory, that kind of thing. So Although it sounds like this one did, no, not it's not my, uh, not the kind of top of my list of ones I want to read. But yeah, I'll, I'll note it down. Well, cool, cool. So what are we on my four? Your four. Okay, so my four, right? It's I can kind of put any one. It's like one A, one B, one C, one D. Um, but so I, yeah, it's just that my favorite is one is one A. But I'll come to that. But yes, my number four is basically the Darth Bane trilogy. Very nice. Okay, well, anyone? I got the high ground on okay, that okay, one. Okay, cool, cool. cool. <laughs> I'll just save that. We'll save that. We'll save that. I know that's what I mean. It's one to four. It's, it's you know I feel a bit silly putting it at four, but okay, well, okay, we'll save that. So now we're on Thomas's four. So four, I'll, I'll bounce between. So ordinary, I, I if I had to rank these two trilogies, uh, the other trilogy is is higher, but just for sake of shaking things up, um, 
I'll go over to the other trilogy and just pick a book out of there because I, I consider them neck and neck. But the Jedi Academy trilogy and specifically Dark Apprentice. Um, I don't know if you have either of you guys read this one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I recognize the cover. Will you just uh, remind me of the story? Oh, yeah. So this one is set. Actually, I, I talk about two time periods. Solo set actually, you know, before A New Hope, obviously. This is the first series that I read. I read this before the, the Thrawn trilogy, but it was after Return of the Jedi. So New Republic era. And I was just drinking that up. But the, the core story is that there's this like ominous uh, super weapon out there called the um, Sun Crusher. It has the ability to, to destroy an entire star. It's like this, uh, there's an image. I actually have a micro machine of it somewhere, but it's like this little teeny ship that flies vertically uh, with a tiny little cockpit on, on the top. And it just ends in this point uh, with the cannon on the bottom. Uh, Han ends up stealing the ship, and so it, it's under New Republic control. At the same time, through the trilogy, Luke is establishing his brand new Jedi Academy, and he's got this uh, skilled student named Kip Duran, Kip Duran, who ends up uh, yeah, coming close to falling to the dark side. But it, I'll just pick Dark Apprentice. It's the second book in the trilogy, and uh, second one's always the best. Yeah, this one you've got this like mysterious like Sith dark sider spirit that uh, that that is kind of corrupting things and and trying to uh, just upturn the whole apple cart. Uh, Luke's the backdrop is that this is Luke's academy is on Yavin Four, and it's just. I have such great memories, like sitting in my room, like for hours, just pouring through this book and um, like wishing that I could get like the toys, like, you know, give, I, in fact, really, I think the only, the only toys from this series that I can remember having were like the extended universe micro machines. But I remember getting that little sun crusher and being like, this is amazing. So dark apprentice for me. Yeah, I, I, this trilogy is fantastic, and Dark Apprentice, I believe, is the uh, like it was one of the origins for Star Killers' nicknames, Dark Apprentice. In most places, I guess I've seen that in a couple places. So Star Star Wars loves to pull from past stuff, and this, this trilogy is. I mean, Kevin Kevin Anderson just goes to work on this. This is a this is solid Star Wars. Like this is the kind of stuff where you're like, this feels like a. I don't know. It made Star Wars feel kind of serial with some of these stories, like more serial than it already was. Well, obviously, but like stretching it out into these like, these trilogies, like they, obviously it's kind of a trope of Star Wars, and for the books to continue to do that until you get to like the Legacy of the Force stuff, where it's like yeah. twelve books, and you're like, oh geez, <laughs> we're still we're still here writing these books. Uh, but yeah, this, this stuff is all good. The Jedi Academy stuff, it being on Yavin Four, is like. One of my biggest gripes with the sequel trilogy is that the Academy, I guess we don't know. It wasn't on Yavin 4, right? No, that, that, no, it wasn't on Yavin 4. So that I always felt like, come on. Yeah, come on. you yeah. can you can throw us that little bone Just when little I bone. generally speaking, I, I was completely fine with the canon reboot. But whenever I hear folks complaining about. Uh, what was done with a character or any of these complaints that are based on an attachment to old works. This series that the Jedi Academy trilogy is, is sort of the one of a limited number of books where I can say, you know, if you're talking that quality stuff, I get it. I get the attachment. I get like that story felt from top to bottom, like you were reading a movie. It, it, it they could have just shot this uh, scene for scene from the book and it would have been an amazing trilogy for for uh, the sequel trilogy. And so I, this is one of the few where I'm like, well, if that's what you're talking about when you make this complaint, I get it to a certain extent. I disagree, but I do get it. But when, like you said, when we're talking about the EU gets like wild, like wild and ridiculous uh, very, very quickly. And people tend to forget some of the more idiotic books that are out there, like the crystal stars of <laughs> the EU universe. But um yeah, so anyhow, that's I get it when it comes to books like this. And Box, any final words on this project? So no, I, I, to be honest, I don't believe I've read that either. Um, but 
my I think my favorite area is between six and seven, like episode six and seven. Um, so yes, because there's just so much potential in and richness in that era. Luke, the rebellion, uh, sorry, the Republic, you know, Han and all that stuff. And um, yeah, so I think that anything within that time frame, I definitely want to see. So uh, yes, make a mental note of that one, definitely. Um, so I think Colin, it's your four, right? My number four, Jedi Trials by David Sherman and Dan Craig. This book to me is so underrated, gets down to a lot of the philosophical cores of what makes Anakin Skywalker like so not a Jedi to a certain extent where he's like, I do not really fuck with a lot of these rules that you guys got going on here. <laughs> like, like this is ridiculous and introduces one of my favorite EU characters that nobody, I feel like nobody talks about. And I feel like they just pigeonholed this man's story into Obi-Wan and uh, Satine in Clone Wars. And that's, uh, I believe it's Nisha Halcyon, Halcyon. He is one of the masters who leads Anakin through his Jedi trial. And throughout the course of this novel, you find out that he is married and has a wife. And they're expecting a child. <laughs> and to Anakin, this is like, whoa, whoa, what are you saying here? So kind of opens his mind to like, maybe there, you know, there's a whole other side to this thing. We could actually find love and be, you know, happy. So this to me was just all dope and going through the Jedi trials. That to me was something that I always wanted as a kid to see. It was just like, cause I was obsessed with like the, uh, the Jedi, what with the the young apprentice? What were those books that were like this thin? They were the old. They were like the ones that they came out the same style as like the Boba Fett young young adult books. They were super thin, but they, they were, were like dozens Jedi of them. Quest. I think is yeah. the yeah yeah them. And this to me was kind of like the adult version of that. And it took place in between two and three. So it's kind of one of my favorite timelines is in between two and three. Just the actual Clone Wars in general. And to have Anakin have to go through the trials without Obi-Wan there. Obi-Wan's not there. He's not even on planet, so we can't even talk to him beforehand. He's got to talk to him <laughs> through a hologram. And he's like, oh, come on, man. Like, I can't even get a pep talk beforehand. So I, I love this book. It's It takes him off world. They go on a... Uh, so he's led by uh, Master Halkion for a, most of the book. It's really fantastic stuff, so... Any uh, box? Have you have you read this? No, book? it's another one I haven't read. So I don't think I've read any of your guys, uh, you know, fives and fours. But yeah, I definitely, obviously, seeing uh, a Jedi trial, things like that, is is definitely a uh, you know an interest because we haven't got too much of it, especially in the canon era. You know, we don't know kind of massively what it looks like. So yeah, definitely appealing. But no, I haven't seen that one or read it. Uh, have you, uh, Thomas? No, and that's why I'm loving this conversation because we don't have a ton of overlap and mm -hmm. so it's as much as i know about star wars and as much as i love it it's like giving me motivation to go look for stuff because there's just such that was the the greatness of the eu right it had enough time uh and we're getting there with the new canon but it had enough time that now that we look back on it with hindsight there's just this massive body of work i mean if you were to go to like a bookstore that had all of these on the shelf it's just it's overwhelming. Uh, I think that's part of the reason they did the reset was because mm -hmm. it's it was daunting. Like if you came into this at, into Star Wars in 2010, 2011, you'd go in and get overwhelmed. You'd have no clue where to start versus Chewie was blown up on a moon. Don't steal my next one. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, it's like it, it was just it was overwhelming for me to a certain extent. But like when I came into the game, there were, you know, maybe two rows or something like that of books and so hang on one second so my uh my auto stop went on the camera so i'll fix that in a second but no i mean it, i this came at a time like i i love hearing these things um and giving my own like myself reason to go back and and search for this stuff yeah to me this is like the what what star wars is all about this is like when you'd go into like books a million or whatever 
and you find like or Barnes and Noble and you just like have a conversation with some random person about like, oh, you like Star Wars too, huh? What are you reading? And people are, like sitting on the floor. Like I remember um was it, like the the Cartoon Network Clone Wars comics. They had like Clone Wars Adventures and it was in the same style as the uh Tartakovsky uh Clone Wars cartoon. And so it was just kind of like a continuation of those or like some kind of like inside in between in between adventures and stuff like that you just find all these little nuggets little morsels of little stuff you're like Ooh, yes I will, I will take that real quick and that's why i love the comics too i'm excited for bogs and i to really get deeper into the comics because i was i was in on the first like 20 issues of star wars like the original run of star wars through hans like through the i guess what do you call it the 2012 13 run of star wars all the way up through like Han Solo's wife and all and all that stuff that was going on through there. But then I fell in love with the Vader stuff. So I'm excited to see, you know, when we get into that stuff, how that goes. Boggs, you're number three. Yes. So, so as well, I didn't mention to uh, Thomas as well. If it's we kind of punt the conversation if it's in the top two. So if okay. for example, when we get to two and one one, we'll just talk about it. But yeah, so uh, my number three is basically the Thrawn trilogy. The original Thrawn yeah, I mean, yeah i mean yeah i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew i'd have your your one and two uh further <laughs> down on mine but okay cool that's a point then so um thomas your three we're gonna go new jedi order we're rolling it back to 1999 vector prime this book rocked my world when it came out it um if you haven't read it chewbacca dies in this book he gets crushed by a planet and that alone should have you going on Amazon and buying some crusty used copy of it. But it was just so radical at the time. I, I think I read it. And as a kid, I didn't know how to process the information. I love Chewbacca growing up, uh, but it was one of the most radical storylines that I can remember doing because it was sort of like you, you read the rest of the books and they would do stuff to characters like awful things would happen to them but by the end of the trilogy or the end of the story things would be sort of back to normal and i think as a kid i got this sense that these characters were always safe there was never this this feeling that they were in significant peril or anything like that and it wasn't until this book he dies saving or helping save uh the um, han and leia's twins Jaina and Jason, and it's just this epic sacrifice, and it it rocked me. I, I I would say that the closest I've come in in canon to it now was sort of the the dupe in Rise of Skywalker, where the resist or the First Order transport gets ripped in half, and you think Chewbacca is dead. Like I sat there and was like in tears in the theater, only to have that sort of wiped away, <laughs> 20, you know, fifteen twenty minutes later, but. Yeah, that, that book had one of the biggest emotional effects on me because of the loss of that character. And I, I just think like I was, I was thinking like, well, where do they go from here? You know, also, I, I don't like you um, was that the Salvatore was the author's name. I was like, I don't like you anymore. So I hope you don't get to write any more of these books. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you, you have that quite high on your list because um, I, I've noticed like people uh, refer to that as like um, a joke almost that Chewbacca d gets killed by a planet. Um, but yeah, like the, it's great that you have that. I've not read it, but I'm aware of the name and I'm, I'm aware that obviously what happens to Chewie in that one. But uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, if you say it's good, then yeah, I'll definitely uh, give it uh, log it. But. I, the, I will say that I won't defend the quality 20 years later, but mm -hmm. I, I will say as a kid, I took, I mean, like Star Wars was my life as a kid, right? I, I was one of those kids that didn't have a ton of friends. Star Wars was sort of my retreat. And, you know, it seems silly now, but at the time I took all of these characters really seriously and, and sort of felt this like personal connection to them. And some of my, you know, some of the books that I enjoyed the most as a kid were, were stuff that objectively now, I think most people would agree are like not great books, but just that connection, like, that emotional event that was reading that moment. Like I, you know, if I had been 10 years older and had read that moment, I'd been like, 
well hell yeah he dies with a planet crashing onto him but at the time i was like chewbacca he couldn't mm. have escaped the planet so <laughs> yeah but um no I, I need to give it a read and uh yeah you know from your five four and three thomas do you have you read the or listened to audiobooks of them or not no no i didn't get into audiobooks until new canon okay fair enough uh colin you read that one yeah weirdly enough i have this is one of the ones where i like i was going to the library a lot as a kid and i grabbed like oh i would look up like series specifically like which ones are series and then i found all this other stuff where it's like oh they launched this like in 99 kind of like which is kind of weird that what they're doing with star wars right now kind of rebranding it where they're taking us in the future and to the past at the same time which is kind of the opposite of what they did in 99 where they try to take us to the future with this book and then take us to the past with the movies this one was i mean yeah it's weird but it's yeah. really ballsy and it's dark as hell and it is not like it's more star trekky at points in terms of like the storyline than star wars which i'm cool with because i know that kind of shit exists in star wars like i'm not stupid so i know that like it can get darker and deeper so for this to all kind of end with like it being the main reason why they didn't keep legends, which Leland Chi has come out and said, like, yeah, Chewie getting crushed <laughs> by a planet is kind of like one of the reasons why we didn't keep these books around. I, th I think that's why I stayed away from it because there's always it's like this negative, um, I don't know, like almost like comical uh, kind of legend about this this book I, and this I, story. I, I so I've always been like, oh, that's not for me, but. I think um, Christian Harloff yeah. has said that over the years. Like he's like always used that as like his reference of legends of why the books don't work, but it's a good book and it's a good book series. And it's all like, it. it's good. It's good stuff. So what so we on your three? My number three. Be the Republic commando series. Oh, good okay. pick. I thought, yeah, that was probably my six. Probably. My I six. am an Xbox kid through and through that original game on xbox was one of the it was basically like playing halo in the star wars universe it was that <laughs> game was not messing around i still have it because they released it they re-released it and now i have it forever on my xbox one and i they eat that stuff up like it it spoke to me in the same way that i go back to it often the cartoon the original cartoon network clone wars series where they had the arc trooper episode where the troopers are just like going around being badass and being sneaky and stuff like that's exactly what Re <laughs> republic commando was but they were huge these dudes were huge like they were swole clones it kind of felt like they were not your mom's clones like the was, spartans like, of star wars yes like they were like wisconsin linebackers <laughs> like they were huge dudes like not your average you know dudes and for me, I mean, these books were just, ah, it was so cool. Like the, like the idea that these guys were so in sync all the time. And but you knew it was because they were programmed to do it. But like, it was just so dope. And seeing the, the war, truly, this was the first stuff from the clones perspective that we ever got. You know, I mean, we, we kind of got some of it in the, in the cartoon, in the first cartoon over Clone Wars. But then we got a lot of it in the clone wars obviously proper series this kind of set the stage for like oh people are engaged with this there's like three or four books in this series like this is like a really good long-running series bogs i'm interested have you read this read these it's books? the first one on your guys list that i've read yeah. yes <laughs> um, yeah no i did like because this connects this um the kind of book and the video game like it, that's one of the kind of early um kind of uh multimedia kind of uh well now i tell you, like they, they obviously had other multimedia platforms but in terms of like n64 playstation this this was kind of one of the first tie-ins and it, the actual they look great like the actual uh kind of cover design of them you know the helmet kind of the blue light across the you know the the glass uh, helmet thing uh but yes it's um fascinating uh kind of aesthetics uh yes definitely like this one i did consider it for my five but yeah i've just got more uh ones that are more character based but yeah good good pick uh, I'm I'm looking over it. I I keep glancing over because I've got 
uh, the action figures on my shelf, Boss and Sev and Scorch, uh, the whole the whole crew there. And I will never forget my first celebration was Celebration 5 in 2010. And was it the third season? They were doing a, a panel to, to sort of kick off the third season of The Clone Wars. And they debuted a clip. Uh, which is the um, this uh, new class Republic assault shuttle lands. It's like a rainy platform. Sassy Tin and Obi Wan are coming out, and the ramp drops on the shuttle, and you just see the blue visor lights, and the whole place just erupted. I mean, the you like the roof blew off the place, and you see the the commandos come down, and they've got. Uh, I think it's Knox and Master Knox's body, the 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 two, the Jedi and Apprentice that were killed on Deveron by uh, Savage Opress. And I just I was just sitting there like completely stunned. And it was this moment where I knew I loved those characters, but it was this connection moment that I had had for the first time with the larger Star Wars community, like that big a crowd. And I'm like, Oh man, we all think exactly the same. And then Filoni had to go and spoil it and be like, "Uh, oh, well, if you're expecting more of Delta Squad, don't get your hopes up." And then it was just that one scene, but that was just a special high water moment for me. Man, it just seems like this story is just like primed to be like put into. I I, I would think maybe some of this is going into the Bad Batch. I would like to think that some of the brotherly love that you saw between They can work guys. with Delta Squad. Yeah, they could totally work. Yeah, like a team up, like the time that the Power Rangers teamed up with the Ninja Turtles for one exactly. episode. Like it would be really cool if you guys like teamed up for one. What I really loved about this stuff though is like the 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 seamlessness of like the rollout of like, the series worked for. I mean, this was out for like eight years. Over a series of eight years, these books were released, and this was like like Boggs, you mentioned it. The video game tie-in, like that was some of the first stuff where they like rolled all this stuff out sequentially. It was yeah, they were like, Oh wow, they really love this pod racing game when we release a pod racing movie. I guess this'll work. And so they <laughs> release, you know, Clone Wars and all this stuff comes out. And this kind of sets up the Clone Wars novels as this whole if you look, there's a whole generation of books that have a Clone Wars novel, and those all interconnect. Like they were actively trying to not step on anybody's toes. And I'd be reluctant if I didn't say in my last book, Jedi Trials, is also one of the first uh, appearances of Asajj Ventress as well. You hear of her workings as well. So that was pretty cool. But, you really love the Clone Wars era, don't you? No, I do. This stuff's <laughs> bar. Like, it, it's, it's, yeah. that stuff's good. It's, it's, like, it, it's just unfortunate that the movies are... I mean, it also had just some of the deepest Mandalorian lore that was out at the time uh, you got this like extensive look into mandalorian culture and history like the the war chant vote and that you hear in the game at different points like i was just gobbling that stuff up because it was sort of a peek into a universe that we hadn't seen before and that's why i think it was so the, the popularity of these books the staying power of these characters is why it was so controversial uh i, I think that was one of the most controversial aspects of the canon reset and and i don't want to put too much like value on one set of books because there are so many good ones that were out there but there was such a fan base of these books that even i think uh, the author karen travis sort of famously and very publicly expressed her significant uh displeasure with disney and lucasfilm over the decision to decanonize these books i don't think i i you know, if I'm remembering correctly, she said she would never write one again, never write in the Star Wars universe again, which is a real shame. But uh, it, you know, it's one of those things where we keep seeing stuff pulled in from legends, sometimes in wholesale. And this is the property that I, they've already, they're canon, right? The, the characters are canon. They're primed and ready. Colin, I'm with you. Bring them into the Bad Batch full force. That'd be exciting. They could be like the heels. They could be oh, like, yeah like they didn't get their chips out and so they're like the big bads that would be sick that would be actually i'm in i'm in on that storyline yeah. right there take me there boggs take me to your number two 
So my number two, I've previously said on different shows, it is my number one. But upon doing research for this, I forgot how much I love my number one, um, which isn't the best in all honesty, uh, but it's my favorite book. But anyway, my two is uh, Plagueis by James Lucino. Uh, anyone that doesn't know, absolute must read. If you want to get into you know, the extended universe, this embodies everything about what uh, the extending universe does so set five years after return of the jedi uh, details uh and kind of looks at darth sidious's master obviously um you know darth Plagueis. um so you understand and learn about palpatine's political nuance his tactical um and strategic uh methods um and what he learns kind of from Plagueis, and how important the sith is uh to his political operations as well um the awesome exploration into the force and how it's uh is it's used and uh the user's interaction with the force as well uh the kind of brutal actions of palpatine what he does kind of to his family what he does to you know uh Plagueis himself and then the story actually goes into episode one like you meet episode one characters you know, i don't want to spoil it for anyone but you that like the tie-in from kind of a, a youngish adult into episode one, man. I mean, like this just filled in his whole backstory for me. For you know, upon reading this, I didn't know his backstory in Palpatine's. I didn't know um, kind of before episode one. I mean, I didn't know his story, so I didn't know what his kind of uh, his how he uh, kind of learned everything and um, how the Sith um, kind of operated in kind of his political. Uh, like I said, strategy and stuff. And um, and Thomas, you, you said that this is like watching a movie. And I, I remember the first time I listened to it, it was at work. So I'm like in my office like this. And I remember having headphones in it, obviously in the audio, but and I remember thinking, I can't concentrate. Like just obviously the music, the characters, Palpatine, the Sith stuff. It's just like, it's too, it's just too much finesse on it. And yeah, it's one of my favorite all time books. And it's uh, absolutely epic from start to finish. And uh, yes, it, it kind of, it helps me um, understand, like I said, just Palpatine and the Sith more and makes him one of my favorite characters because we've got so much backstory there. Uh, it's like the perfect uh, Star Wars book for me. So, um, yeah, so go ahead, Thomas. Plagueis is one of those books where this is one of the few that I would hold up as an example where if, if I got met by somebody that's like, well, I don't read those books because mm -hmm. they're not official anymore. Mm -hmm. That would be exhibit A in my argument that, it doesn't matter. It's just that good a story. That that was another one I, you add to the short list of books that that kind of stirred up all the f the most furor over the reset that that yeah. this wouldn't be official. Lucino is so good, and it gives so much flavor and background. But what I how I look at that book now and, and all of these on the list that that I'm familiar with at least. Uh, Timothy Zahn, I've, I've seen him on multiple panels and he always gets asked the question, like, what did you think about the reset when it just kind of wiped your books out? And he always gives this like very articulate, like thoughtful response where he says, these books are not gone, right? Not just because you can still buy them, uh, which they didn't, you know, Disney didn't have to allow, I guess, but also because the stories aren't gone. It just doesn't erase the stories. It doesn't erase your love of them. It doesn't erase them being good tales. And he was, he's his suggestion, which I, I try to adopt in my own life is to see these as like the tales from, uh, the the knights uh arthur and his uh knights of the round table right the, you know this stuff is steeped in mysticism and and you know legend is it real is it not the real question is does it matter do you enjoy it you know do you enjoy sitting around the fire so to speak and hearing this tale about characters that you're familiar with like that's where the value comes it shouldn't matter that what you're reading is not official and it's not uh, gonna appear in like a canon trivia contest. That's not the measure. It, it ought not to be. So if you've been on the fence about diving in, I, I would say even though my list is what it is, uh, Darth Plagueis or, or Plagueis is a, a good novel to jump into and just see if it's for you because it's just a good story. Well yeah, I don't really see it as like a opportunity. I don't see it as one of the things that they would go out of their way to like change the history of too much i guess they've kind of done it with the ahsoka novel where there's some stuff in there now that doesn't quite line up with what they did with season seven of the clone wars but plagueis is that they 
I think that's a, like you said, that's a good spot to start. I enjoy the novel and it gives you, it, we've kind of all kind of had this where I had Labyrinth of Evil and then Thomas, you had the, uh, the, uh, the Han Solo novel that you thought kind of enriched episode four and Boggs, you got this one that kind of enriches episode one. We all mm-hmm. kind of, we, we thirst for that. We, which, which I can see now why it's like, oh yeah, let's green light Rogue One, this movie that directly enhances another movie. It kind of seems like they did their, you know, their due diligence on the research there. So Thomas, take us over to your number two. I'm going to roll it back to the 90s again and give the first rogue squadron book by michael stackpole nice. i will fully confess that i didn't make it through the entire rogue squadron series because it quickly spun off not just in the video game but there was a comic series based on the books and uh rightfully so it got huge but it all started with the the uh the um, rogue squadron book just the, the name of the squadron was the book uh and this was the first book that didn't feature the big three, Luke, Leia, and Han. And I remember somebody, a friend of mine told me about it and they were like, these characters aren't in there. And I was like, well, that can't be good. Like Luke's an X-Wing pilot. Like why wouldn't Luke be in it? He's part of Rogue Squadron. They're like, no, 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 no. Just give it a chance. And it was phenomenal. Like this is, this book is the proof of concept of why a movie like Rogue One, where you don't have, uh, principal cast from the original trilogy and it, why it can work. It's proof of concept why Mandalorian works with without, you know, even if you strip away like Luke's scene and, and uh, you know, any kind of real connections to, to bigger characters that we're familiar with because, you know, whether it's Corn Horn or uh, Taiku Selchu, they're just good characters, characters that you care about. I was always a fleet junkie growing up. So like, you know, all the starfighters, X wings, Y wings, the capital ships, star destroyers, and Mon Cal cruisers. I eat that stuff up. I would, to this day, if you were like, hey, you want to watch the, the Battle of Endor, uh, just the space parts, um, I'd be like, cool, I'll watch that 100 times in a row and not blink. And this book gave you that in, in story form. And I was always a big fan of Wedge, even though he bailed out on Luke in the trench. But getting to see him sort of take center stage and have his character fleshed out in like a meaningful story where you get to know other folks behind the cockpit, like the kind of character, like in the movies, you see these characters and they're like, they get one line like, oh, my, he's on me. I can't shake him. And then that's all you see of that pilot or like copy that gold leader. This is the book that kind of fleshes those characters out and gives them meaningful stories. And it just, again, it's one with a cult following now, rightfully so maybe I'm downplaying it. It's more of a cult, more than a cult following. There are folks that sort of built their lives in star Wars around this, but it's phenomenal. And then you got like that N64 video game. And I was just in complete heaven in the late nineties. I was just loving it. And to see the announcement on the Disney uh, investors call that, Patty Jenkins is making a rogue squadron movie, even if it doesn't take, you know, much of anything from the books, it's just awesome. And there was an exchange between Patty Jenkins and Stackpole on Twitter where he's like, this is so cool. Like this is amazing. And she responded and she's like, I love your books. They're such a, such an inspiration. And they're like a guiding light for us. Some, you know, something along those, but she was just very gracious to him. And I was like, this is awesome. Like if, if you told my 12 year old self that, this stuff would be happening now for a book that I loved so much as a kid. I wouldn't believe you. I wouldn't believe you either. Cause this stuff is crazy. Like the fact that that's happening and we know it's happening. It's in the books. The ha- like the, it's you can only hope that they at least, you know, take a little bit of it, sprinkle a little bit of it, but they'll, there's no way that they don't nail the tone of the books, which I think is the important part. Yeah. You can take the essence of the characters. You can change the names up to fit in the canon, whatever you want to do. But I think the essence of that squad is what's going to carry over to the film, which I think is what is really, really special about those books is how you care about each individual member for different reasons. And they give you, and they flush it out. Obviously it's, it's like seven or eight books, right? It, it, yeah. It's, it's a lot of books. <laughs> it's, it's 
Boggs, do you have any uh, experience with this series? I believe I've read the first one. So I'll, I'll be honest. So my some of my least favorite stuff is the pilot X-Wing square rodgers blasphemy and stuff yeah no no i still like it i still like it it's just that for me i just you know i say it nearly every episode the more i i'm just naturally more appealed to the force stuff uh, you know the war stuff jedi sith you know that kind of stuff so this stuff yeah it's cool yeah obviously you know it has huge following like you're saying like people some of the literally this is some of uh people's favorite kind of themes in all star wars right the, the pilot stuff and and wedge and things like that so yes definitely like it um but i don't naturally appeal to it so um like even patty Jen patty jenkins stuff like i'm not massively excited about it. i'm not gonna lie there's way more kind of more exciting other stuff for me but yes i completely understand why people like it um but yes i, I have read that one but i've not read you know all seven or whatever um what are we on colin your two mine two bongs we've done it we've made it it's time to talk about timothy zahn's <laughs> heir to the empire the thrawn trilogy this is what people thought episode seven was for about 30 years. I <laughs> felt <laughs> like this is kind of what everyone went off of is like, yo, this was canon and then feel free to work off of this was basically the respect shown basically until Disney bought Lucasfilm. I mean, these these were as canon as it was going to get. I was absolutely enthralled as a kid with Thrawn. Thrawn is one of the most interesting characters in all of Star Wars because he's, you can say that he's uh, a riff on uh, Khan. Obviously, their names are a bit similar and they act a, a pretty much the same. And most times they're pretty calculated individuals. But I love that in Star Wars. And to one of my favorite you know, things he does is his respect for his opponents is... is is all is his entire essence of being like he has to understand them to a t in order to truly defeat them and this book really gave you more of a dabbling in this whole series gave you more of a side of like why a villain was doing what they were doing and i think it was his loyalty to the emperor in this series that really was like Oh, this dude is kind of crazy, but I get why he's crazy. I mean, this em the emperor kind of pulls him out and kind of, you know, gives him his whole life. And he's just really doing all of this because he's grateful for the opportunity, which is even more messed up about it. That he's, <laughs> he's that crazy. Uh, Boggs, this was down. I think you said this was your number four. Uh, three. Three. Okay. So this is my three. Yeah, so uh, this trilogy, I mean, it, at times it gave me goosebumps about how it felt like to me, like, like you said, this was the continuation of the original trilogy. Um, the, the, as well, it's, again, anyone that hasn't read this, it's so easy to read and go through and understand and pick things up as opposed to a lot of other books where you get lost with the story, with the characters, there's too many characters, but this is just so easy. You get the continuation of the main characters, Han, Luke, Leia, uh, there's Jedi that introduced, there's warlords, there's dark side users. Um, and you find out what happens to everyone and the introduction of Mara Jade, awesome, amazing character and Thrawn, of course. Um, I, I did feel the second one drags a little bit. I do remember it being uh, very dialogue heavy. Um, but, you know, the highs of the first book and the third are, are definitely um, like, this is what, you know, after leading, sorry, leading into the sequel trilogy, the high, this for me, this was the continuation. So the level that they've set, um, was what I was expecting. Like you got to top that book like that, you know, if not, you know, make something like for like. So obviously we've got something very different. Um, so yeah, that I was kind of more hopeful of this than, than what we actually got. So, uh, but yes, overall, absolutely fantastic trilogy. This is my favorite trilogy in star Wars, um, extended universe. So oh, and Mara yes. Jade too, you know, we can't, not yeah, that's what I'm Mara. saying. Yeah. yeah like, they, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yes. Uh, the new characters, the old characters, the law, love it um yeah so what do you think thomas if it says anything the at dragon con they always give like some sort of like small prize to to whoever wins it, it's never anything it's not like cash or anything like that mm -hmm. but uh my favorite prize was a sort of a special edition relaunch they did uh you know post 
change over to legends, but they, they reissued the trilogy and it's this like paperback set that creates this scene. If you line the covers up, it's like one big picture, but it's a Thrawn trilogy. And that I got that one year when I won. And to this day, it's like sitting center shelf in front of me. Um, that's see that series meant a lot to me. If, if, you don't know the history of these of Star Wars books. That's the trilogy that launched a thousand ships, right? That's the trilogy that sort of reopened the door to new Star Wars and new books. As my uh, as my camera cuts off again, but that I mean that was it. It wasn't the first trilogy that I I read, but it was one of the most meaningful. And the fact that we've got more Thrawn books out now is just phenomenal. The the fact that they've been able to bring his character and lots of aspects of that trilogy back into canon is amazing. Yeah, that's yes. um, that's that's why that's why Star Wars is just so it it you can offer anything. Like, like that's why I love like. It, this is an opportunity for Zahn to just create. I mean, this is like, how cool is this? That this this is some of the original fan fiction. People feel like this is more their episode seven, eight, nine than the movies that came out, and that's still true to this. Yeah, Boggs, look at you, like, 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 and that's no, it's crazy. not that literally, but like, yeah, yeah no, like... no, I'm with you, I'm with you. But there, there's an attachment to it, and I think that that's you know some respect to be shown. And I think that that's why, you know, these books have lasted so long and have stood the test of time is that they're just solid, solid novels and they run together very well. And they tell the stories just like you would expect them to do in a movie, just like you were saying earlier, Thomas, they could have done this shot for shot, right? Like <laughs> they could have done it and people would have been totally cool with that and it would have been totally fine. Boggs, you know what people are going to be totally cool with? Your number one. I don't think so, actually, because it's a little bit out there. <laughs> it is. Uh, I want to know if you guys have read it as well. It's called Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader. Mm -hmm. I have not read that. Written read by it. James Lucino. Oh, man, I mean, this this is the book that I've read the most, and I've listened to the audio book the most. Um, and I must have first... I, don't, I, I should have wrote down the year that was released. I don't actually know. But for me, after Return, uh, Revenge of the Sith, there was kind of no other stories. So uh, I was reading the kind of Revenge of the Sith um, uh, visual um, uh, novelization, sorry. Uh, and this was the next book after that. And man, I mean, the, the law in this book is like, is it goes beyond Plagueis. Like the, the stuff that it fills in for you. So it's set a few weeks after uh, Revenge of the Sith. Um, it basically, it tells the story of Vader's early life and how, and how it feels in his body. So you learn about... Um, how he has to like his, how heavy his legs are he has to constantly use the force um his breathing apparatus he can't sleep because of how um you know the breathing kind of makes him keeps him awake the mechanics of his suit his helmet his arms like you just learn about everything about vader and uh, on top of that there's there's this is basically he's also hunting jedi as well so there's three jedi that are um kind of on the run basically so which he's chasing and you you the whole way through you get in his commentary and filling in his um his inner monologue um and it just kind of builds the law around vader so imagine watching return of the, uh, revenge of the sith then reading the novelization and then learning about this here it's, it's gripping stuff and him battling these three jedi um and he's hunting them and this is his introduction into the empire so no one knows who he is no one knows that you know he's kind of uh the emperor's right hand man so and on the opposite side of this you also get moments with obi-wan and you see like a there's like a, it's almost like a news announcement where you, you, you see or hear or, or read, you see the, the part where he finds out, everyone finds out that Anakin is Vader and you, you get that in the book. Uh, and so this is the closest thing to basically, like I said, Vader hunting Jedi. Uh, and they're one of the main stories that I wanted when, you know, Disney's takeover. So this for me, this was kind of until I realized it wasn't basically. So uh, yes, definitely hundred percent recommend the audio book as well. Fascinating read. Uh, it's not one that people put high on the list, but because um, it feels like something, oh, it's like a Revenge of the Sith spinoff. Absolutely not. No, I'd put it up there, like I said, with with Plagueis and stuff. So electric, electric, because um, it even tells you like he has to use the Force to when he, when he's when he's fighting. So when he's with his lightsaber, he's using it to move his legs and using the Force generally anyway. So he's never at his full strength. And it fills in all these little things and and it kind of makes sense. And uh, yes, I absolutely love this. This is the most kind of 
um, answers I've got in a book uh, that that fit the kind of visual things that you see in the movie. So fantastic book, uh, one of my favorites. Um, so you've read it, Colin? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, this book was basically like, I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I read Lords of the Sith and I was like, oh, y'all jacked this whole yeah, thing. Yeah, they do the same thing in that as well. Yeah, they, they kind of both, you hear Vader's monologue a lot. That's my favorite stuff from both of these yeah. books is mm -hmm. exactly what you were getting into. And then also that scene with Obi-Wan then busts into Qui-Gon's spirit showing up and telling him it's all good. Luke's going to talk to him when he's an adult and it's all going to be okay. And Ben's like, cool, got it thanks i appreciate it and that like yeah all, all the stuff in between two and three in between three and four i will gobble any of that stuff up like it is prime that to me is like prime star wars there is so much going on in so many different places at that time where like obviously you got rebels set up in there you got the clone war set up in there and i got ahsoka set up in there it's all I and mean, anything can happen in that timeline it's when all that's when all my favorite peeps are all around and hanging so for me, this book was just too much fun. I, I love, uh, you go to Kashyyyk too. I love the references to Kashyyyk. You go back to Kashyyyk to see like what it's like there since the Empire has kind of, you know, moved in because they were already moved in with the clones and then the bad guys just kind of flipped to an occupation zone. Uh, yeah, all that stuff was cool. I'm, I'm down with all that. So I'm, don't be don't be shy to put this in number one box. This James is Asina as well. Yeah, yeah. You guys have told me. me. Yeah, I'm about to hop on Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like this is the most I've uh, read and uh, listened to. So, yes, absolutely electric because, um, yeah, like after, I, again, I, I watched it growing up and after Revenge of Sith, there was nothing. So to me, this was my, so where, where people watch the original or after the original trilogy and they read the, you know, the, the Thrawn trilogy and that was their continuation. This was my continuation of, um, of you know, the prequel. So, yes, absolutely must, must read. Um, yeah. Well. Thomas, so I look forward to your review, to Thomas. Your number one. I'm a Vader stan, so I shamefully uh, have to to admit that I haven't read that. But that that sounds amazing. Uh, one of my bet you talk about the comics. My absolute two favorite series of all the hundreds of comics that that have come out since the Can reboot have been the two Vader 25 issue runs, the one by Charles Sewell, and then the original 25 issue run. Uh, that ends in fact with uh, him meeting the creator of his suit and then dealing with him, I'll say, <laughs> but yeah, that sounds phenomenal. I just, I eat his early years up, uh, especially cause it's not like, like the, the image of Vader that most people have is like, that's exactly what Palpatine wanted. Like he wanted this brute force guy, but in reality, which it sounds like Lucino does a good job of like, the Vader as he is in uh, a new hope and the original trilogy is not what Palpatine wanted. Like he Vader fa Anakin failed, Vader failed. And the apprentice that Palpatine thought he was getting was not what was delivered after he got put back together and seeing him sort of work through all of that, getting the chance to see it in a book form. Cause Lucino is just, a, a maestro when it comes to writing evil characters um yeah that's that's top of my list of all the ones we've talked about that i haven't read good but my number one i'm going to go back to the the jedi academy trilogy because i've taken a diversion from it the the ultimate final book in it champions of the force everything comes together in it this is a book it was released in 94 so it was released before i kind of got my dive into star wars books but I remember like de once I finished uh, Dark Apprentice, desperately doing chores around the house, like mowing the lawn, doing whatever I could to, to convince my parents to take me back to the bookstore to get uh, Champions of the Force so I could figure out how this whole thing ended. It's, it's epic in scope. Uh, Kip Duran, Luke's sort of uh, one of his great students, has uh, has run off. He's stolen the Sun Crusher, this devastating weapon. Uh, there is an, a phenomenal Imperial character in, in all of this that I hope at some point gets brought back in, Admiral Dalla, who is like, I would, I would put her up on the level of Grand Admiral Thrawn in terms of 
outstanding, like non-force using Imperials, just like tactically brilliant officers. But you get this massive showdown at this, this secret Imperial installation called the Maw. It's sort of like in, in current canon uh, hive base, like the Tarkin initiative base where they've got all these secret weapons under development and whatnot. And uh, this is where they, the, uh, the, the Sun Crusher originated and it was kind of sitting there waiting for a signal to, to go out into the galaxy and cause chaos. But uh, the Alliance sort of makes, or the New Republic, I should say, makes uh, mounts an attack and, and you have this massive showdown. It's just the, and, and then um, obviously Luke has to deal with not just this, this Sith spirit Exar Kun, but he's got to deal with bring not just the you know not necessarily destroying because I don't think he at any point nobody wanted to to kill Kip, but figure out a way to bring him back into the fold. And it, the I don't know that I would call this the best book, like writing wise or story wise. I, I might give that crown to to uh, heir to the Empire, but just the emotional connection that I had to this book. So many on my list are ones that I just have this nostalgic connection to that, like these vivid memories of reading them for the first time. And I, I remember getting home from the bookstore and just like running up and shutting my door and like, don't bother me. I'm, <laughs> I'll be in a galaxy far, far away and just uh, not stopping except to eat until I was done with the book. So champions of the force for me. Yeah, I agree with you completely. That book is phenomenal the series is phenomenal and sometimes yeah you know, i know you listed two uh you know the second one uh, earlier but then you you know this one kind of ties up in a bow very rare is it that the the bow tying book is the best one so i appreciate that in this form where yeah i love this one where you got uh the mar jade and lando go to kessel Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, like that's awesome. <laughs> like that's like, oh, cool. <laughs> that's very random, but I really enjoy it. And it kind of eases you into this, like, like it just feels like another story and another, you know, and oh, on to the next one. And it ties the bow up nicely. Boggs, any uh, history with this? No, but as uh, Thomas was explaining, I was also reading the uh, Wikipedia page. So, like, Leia, Han, Aqua, Wedge, Chewbacca, Mon Mothma, uh, Lando, Mara, Luke. Like, yes, like I need to read this, like now. So, yeah, yeah, Parker, definitely bro, cool, kid, cool cats in the Star Wars galaxy. Yeah, in his training academy. Yeah, it's definitely all my stuff. I, I, I eat this stuff up. So, yes, I haven't read this, uh, read this. So, definitely I need to catch up on that. So, yeah, good shout. Hmm. Well, looks like we all down to you. One. And that would be the Darth Bane trilogy my favorite star wars story probably of all time i would say from the movies from the comics to the books this series has everything you need it is totally the essence of a luke skywalker on the other side of the coin or the a luke from the other side of the tracks if you will where you're just doing what you feel is right to survive but survival has a different story or a different meaning back in the times that we're dealing with here to see Bane's rise as a slave, you know, kind of working it up through the, through the pit. You know, he was a miner, right? And we're going to go through a mine from the miners all the way to the Sith, all the way to creating the rule two, all the way just keeps going and going, just keeps raising the stakes. You read of the great Sith Jedi wars realize, Oh, this is one of the first books. It's like, Hmm, the Sith were actually a race of people, and then it turned into the like it, it's it it's very confusing. But I loved it for its confusion. Like, oh, this is wild. Where the the Sith Academy that they went to was so dope. I thought that was like <laughs> I oh I thirsted for that in Star Wars canon. Like something just even we because truthfully we've barely seen like like we've seen in the clone wars more so like what it's like to be a padawan but like we gotta see that at some point like what it was like to be trained in the ancient ways of the dark side and from a different point of view than even the rule of two so and all that leading up to you know bane basically just wiping everybody out because he doesn't like because he doesn't he doesn't think they're gonna get it so all right cool just gonna be me and somebody else and then 
getting the apprentice and that storyline just keeps going and going and going and creates the legend of darth bane um boggs you had this one earlier on your list so i will throw it to you first yeah i had it number four so like i said to be honest uh, two three and four that they, they could have jumped around yeah number one is just a special place for me because i love that but um yeah it could have easily been like my two the obviously the the origins of him um and the origin of the, of the jedi as well that you get so you get to follow him as a kid in his training his rise to power and his corruption so you know, it's, i feel like you kind of root for him and then you root against him and then obviously the formation of the sith the grand army uh and then yeah the rule of two so uh epic storytelling um kind of if you want to get into the old uh, stories in terms of the knights of republic that era then yeah i think this is kind of where you start so yes absolutely fantastic book by drew carpetian of course um yes it's just not i've never i don't know i just so I, I think i think uh yeah i don't know i've never it's never been my favorite uh for some reason um i don't know why but yes it's definitely got good elements in uh and yeah you can't not like the uh the formation of, of the rule of two but uh yes epic storytelling no doubt how about you thomas yeah the i love colin your comparison to to uh, you know, the light side stories that we've seen that that you get sort of the inverse in this story and a really that, that kind of culminates in an exceptionally dark way and my hope is that i don't know that we'll ever get this on screen but my hope is that the story like the acolyte right that the show that's coming takes this sort of model and translates it because i think if if you're talking bane's path just generally speaking um you know one where as you say boggs you're you're as an audience member rooting for then a against but maybe not fully against mm -hmm. them <laughs> you're like you're seeing some of their rationale in it i think that's compelling stuff uh you know it's um you know it it, it makes for it made for a, a fantastic trilogy here but i think it's a good model if they're going to go that way and they've got the opportunity if you know considering acolytes going to be set sort of in that uh way uh, way back then time frame uh, to use some of those story beats. Uh, Colin, what did you think about when you finally got to see Bane, albeit kind of really, really short uh, in the Clone Wars? And it's Mark Hamill. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> holy shit, it's Mark <laughs> Hamill that he's playing Bane and just kind of justifies everything. Like, it's, it's so weird to me how, like, I get little, little bits of stuff where it's like there's, there's little moments where, like, there's stuff in the canon novels that now, like, you see it in the in the movies or the tv show and you're like oh 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 it's like the leo sitting up in the chair from once upon a time in hollywood <laughs> this was that moment for me where i was like oh oh yes i know this and there's tons of people that watch that and they're like cool awesome and it's what's really the only mention of really the rule of two there's only a couple real mentions of it in canon one of them is Yoda at the end of episode one, where he says, always two that there are, or there are. And uh, not too many other versions, uh, uh, not too many other references. I mean, Thomas, you're... you're I think Qui-Gon says it as well, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. In yeah. episode one. So only, only but it's just like mystery, I, but I think that's, that's a really good point because the, the Sith as... You know, a religion, a a race, whatever, however you want to characterize them, it's a mystery box. And even like even Yoda in that moment doesn't seem to to know. It, like he's like, yeah, you created the rule of two, right? So he, it almost seems like Yoda. He probably knows more than he's letting on. But uh, you know, these are secrets. All of this Sith lore is stuff that the Jedi probably have locked in a holocron somewhere, but it's stuff that they've put in a box. And I think it's like, it's amazing to think about in the context of the fall of the Jedi and in both Palpatine and Dooku's words in terms of the, the lack of foresight and the narrow mindedness of the Jedi and sort of refuse it, not, not to it from their perspective, it's the refusal for the Jedi to embrace a larger point of view, but it's, it's almost like a refusal to learn from history to, to sit there and like teach these lessons 
uh, to, to Padawans, to expose them to this darkness, not as a temptation, but as a, uh, as a warning. You see it play out in, in the Dooku Jedi Lost uh, audio drama. And then now it's, now it's a book, but uh, where, you know, Dooku and sifo Dyas are like exploring this like secret, the Bogan, the, this secret archive in the Jedi temple of uh, Sith artifacts and stuff. And it's like, um, my Harry Potter knowledge is really rusty, but it's like, you know, the forbidden book section, right? Like you cannot go there. Yeah. The Jedi aren't cracking these things open. And I, I just think it's so cool to, the to restricted like, section. Exactly. I'm not going to be an IG player anytime soon. We'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah, it's like, I like, this is a fascinating look because you don't get that intentionally. So because that you get this Jedi centric story in the original trilogy. Yeah, it's, yeah, and it's just to, just that on that Clone War scene, like it's so he's so kind of um, it just seems so evil and like intimidating and big and mystical, and it's like no wonder like these guys maybe have hid them in uh, you know the law of the of the Sith in holocrons and things like because it seems like Yoda doesn't or like maybe the Jedi don't want any part of that because it seems so beyond what they are kind of used to and and having the balance and what these guys will go through and what they've done. So yes, that, that definitely that's that single scene was one of the best moments in all Clone Wars. Um, just seeing the potential of what we could get uh, on screen, uh, obviously via, you know, from the previous mediums that we have. So yes, absolutely love that scene. A buddy um, of mine who had not read those books, we were watching it around the same time and he's like, who, who is this Star Wars shredder? <laughs> I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> Nope. That's very close. But that's not inaccurate. No, it's yeah. not inaccurate at all. He's just a very mad guy. He's not a bad guy. He's just a really <laughs> mad guy. <laughs> He's just mad at everyone. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> just let him do evil. It's okay. Yeah, and uh, and obviously, like the the thought of Yoda and the Jedi kind of pushing all that away is what leads Luke to kind of throw all of it away and run away to arc two he's like no we, we don't need to be dabbling in this stuff like this stuff never ends up going well like we've seen this time and time again where we try to do the right thing and then all of a sudden we totally push away one side of this and look what happens some nice boy with nice hair burns down my temple or some other boy with nice hair burns down my temple. And it's like, Oh Yoda, we have that in common. We've had a nice boy with nice hair come burn down our house. So it seems to be that they probably wanted to figure all that out. And Bane kind of, I mean, he has kind of the dramatic, you know, end, but for the most part, he's pretty successful once things start rolling for him like very rarely do things go bad i think he's he's not really the best teacher that they get into some of the apprentice work i'm spacing on the apprentice's name but she's kind of like she's not too far from him in terms of being stubborn as hell but it just kind of sees there's a bit of growth with him there where he sees like, Oh, I do need to, if I ever want people to understand what's going on, at least for me, I got to be willing to teach and people aren't just going to learn it on, on their own. Like I did, which is kind of how he sees his whole life is trial by fire. So I'm, I'm in giving Tom Hardy as Darth as a uh, Darth Bane and like. Bane both ways. He'd be Bane twice. <laughs> Boggs. We did it, man. What do you think about these lists? Yeah, so obviously we ranked Legends, we ranked Canon last week. So yeah, it's been uh, it's been fun. Um, I think next week we'll move away from the books now because it's it's taken yeah it's uh, taken a lot of effort to to get these lists. But yeah, my uh, no more recommendation, of course, as well for you, Thomas, is that that uh, Dark Lord, uh, kind of Rise of Darth Vader, definitely recommended. Love that, uh, love that very much. But thanks so much for coming on, Thomas. Is there uh, anything as well you want to plug um, whilst you're here? No, I look for me in the draft next week. We'll see how free agency in the Schmodown goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just hoping to get picked up by a team and start slinging some Star Wars knowledge soon. Hope so. But man. thanks for having me. Can't wait. Boggs, this is it. We've done it. It's, I, it's my favorite thing on Fridays now, is just hanging out, talking some Star Wars. It's every Friday right here on the Pop Culture Universe. Boggs, working to find folks at the interwebs, find you. 
discussed us here on the Pop Culture Universe. Uh, like you said, we have the High Ground every Fridays. We do Pop Talk every Sundays. Uh, catch on the Ultimate Shmana Show uh, live. Uh, we're going live Saturday this week. That's the 23rd at 2 p.m. PST. Um, that is the last show on that channel. Uh, tune in to where uh, we're going to a new YouTube channel uh, for the Ultimate Shmana Show. Tune in live for that update. Uh, but yeah, don't follow me on Twitter. I'm boring on Twitter. So yeah. Nick Fox, you, you you speak too lightly. You're not boring on Twitter. You just refuse to engage. So yeah. I am the opposite. I engage with everything. You can find me at the underscore C Boris wherever columns are sold. And that'll do it, folks, for this episode of We Have the High Ground. You can catch us here next week where we'll be doing a list of who knows, maybe top Ahsoka moments, maybe top Bo Katan moments. Who knows? We might be doing something. We'll both but you know what? We will be here. And remember, folks, as always. We have the high ground, and we'll see you next time. Bye!